pirate media has lied to us. If Assassin's Creed was accurate, you'd spend half the game hunting slaves along the African coast, the other half selling them in Brazil. If Black Sails was accurate, the main characters wouldn't assist the Slayer Revolt. They'd be the ones putting it down. If Sid Meier's Pirates was accurate, your gameplay loop would consist of raiding settlements for slaves and selling them to sugar plantations. And if Pirates of the Caribbean was accurate, Jack Sparrow would attack a guinea man, steal all the slaves, and give a hundred of them to David Jones to sell his debt. Then he'd keep a little boy for fetching his rum, a few slaves for rowing his boat, and a woman as his personal sex slave. A pirate history is not a joke. It isn't Monkey Island or a movie based off some amusement park ride. It was a profession which thrived on human misery. I'm tired of this vital part of colonial history being reduced to footnotes and memes, to caricatures and comic relief. By brushing the actual history under the rug, it prevents you from reflecting on the darker side of human ambition and what cruelties it leads men into. With that said, the racial dynamics about a pirate ship were incredibly complicated, and since it is seldom discussed in historical communities, I struggle with writing the script. There is just so much to say, so I'm going to begin with an abstract before deep diving into the topic. There exists no evidence of pirates attacking plantations, factories or slave ships with the goal of liberating slaves. Slaves were both a valuable trade commodity and a useful labor force aboard the pirate ship itself. Pirates were selfish profiteers, not idealistic proto-abolitionists. This money-driven pragmatism also led them into recruiting other races, if there was a need for manpower. Any non-white found aboard a pirate ship could be a free crewman, a forced crewman, a slave laborer, and cargo to be sold. All of these could be found aboard the same ship at the same time. I usually cite the buccaneer ship Trinity as the prime example of racial dynamics aboard a pirate ship. The conditions aboard were thoroughly documented by seven of her own crewmen. Aboard were three Indians and blacks fighting alongside the buccaneers. But they also had enslaved blacks and Indians, performing menial labor. At one point, the slaves rose up against their masters. At the end of the buccaneers' voyage, the captain was gifted a mulatto boy. One of the slaves, a shoemaker, was set free. At least two of the buccaneers expressed racist views in the writings, whilst the others seemed apathetic. With the abstract out of the way, I'll present in brief what I'll be covering in this video. We'll be taking a look at piratical involvement in the slave trade throughout the entire 1630 to 1730 period. Next we'll take a look at how slaves were used by pirates, and finally, how and why a few of them were recruited. But first, I want to discuss the overarching attitude of slavery in this period. Nowadays we like to view history and racial attitudes from a very black and white perspective. You are either racist or non-racist. And there is a sort of perpetual chicken or the egg debate going on, whether it was racism that allowed for slavery, or slavery that allowed for racism. Slavery was enacted out of convenience. American colonization was at its inception, driven by a massive need for manual labor. Not just in the sugar and tobacco plantations. In 17th century Cuba, nearly all menial tasks were performed by slaves. The transatlantic slave trade did not properly take off until the Europeans had exhausted all of their other alternatives. Native Americans were employed as slaves and serfs, many of whom died to European diseases. Indentured servants were brought in from Europe. These were white Europeans, constricted to servitude for a certain time, by a contract they sometimes signed willingly, other times not. Some indentured servants had no opportunities in life but to sign the contract. Others were criminals, sometimes even pirates, given the option of indenture or death. Well, they'd never be free of the contract, so it was just a slow death. Many more were just people kidnapped from the streets or even conquered. Entire villages of Irish and Scotsmen were dragged off in the English civil wars and shipped off to the Caribbean. The early populations of Jamaica and Barbados were primarily Scots and Irish. Indentured labor had its downsides. It was more expensive than importing African slaves. White laborers were unadapted to the tropical climate and susceptible to tropical diseases and high risks of skin cancer. Even a white Caribbean landowner couldn't expect a lifespan over 40 years. Africans, to the contrary, were more adapted to the climate and already immune to many of the tropical diseases. The transatlantic slave trade was first and foremost an act of convenience. Whilst black Africans made up the bulk of slaves, there are examples of other races being enslaved as well. 
I already discussed the indentured whites. In the 13 colonies, it was common to keep Native American slaves, captured, bought and sold from the many border conflicts. The Baymen, pirate lumberjacks in the Yucatan Peninsula, frequently made excursions into the interior and captured Native Mayans. These were either kept in the Baymen camps as laborers and sex slaves, or shipped off to the slave markets in Jamaica and Virginia. Some of the more exotic slaves came from India. They were referred to as Lascars. In 1689, William Damper reported that a New York slaver arrived at the Coromandel Coast, seeking slaves taken prisoner in the local wars. Slavery wasn't merely practiced and perpetuated by whites. Slave traders primarily acquired slaves by purchasing them from Africans. These Africans usually made slaves from prisoners of war and criminals. Due to the high profits from the slave trade, criminals were enslaved on the flimsiest of charges, and conflicts were sparked merely to capture more slaves. It was an evil circle. Free blacks born in the Americas were as likely to be employed aboard slave ships as any other race, and they didn't seem any likelier to harbor abolitionist sympathies, even if they were sometimes given the blame during uprisings. The barbarity of slavery made some question how God could accept such a practice. The answers were either that African lives were improved by being taken from their primitive homeland and forced into the civilized world. The more popular argument was religious. It was A-OK -okay to enslave heathens. Slaves in the Protestant world were typically denied a baptism as to legitimize their condition. Or as one writer put it, some more scrupulous overseers might not be willing to handle a cat nine tails so often against their fellow Christians as they would against infidels. Whilst there weren't any 17th century movements to abolish slavery, the practice had its critics, such as the novelist Afra Bean and the sailor Edward Barlow. But these found themselves in a minority, and I never found any pirate critical of the practice. Consider that these men saw themselves as superior, even to the common white sailor. Henry Morgan, amongst the greatest of the first buccaneers, decreed that prisoners be treated with respect. Slaves, on the other hand, were fair game. His buccaneers were free to murder, torture and rape them as they please, because this was simply an opportunity to economically damage their Spanish enemy. This highlights the general attitude towards slaves as little more than property farm animals. Paris was intrinsical to Franco-English colonization in the Caribbean. Buccaneers provided protection and a cheap influx of stolen produce. Slaves were especially important for newly established colonies, who were dependent on a rapid influx of a cheap labor force. Jamaica, for example, was virtually desolate when the English conquered it in 1655. Buccaneers helped bring in money and slaves, which the newly settled plantationers could use to kickstart the sugar industry. Jamaica became the heart of the 17th century slave trade. The French nicknamed it Little Guinea, since they would frequently make incursions to steal slaves. Slave raids were practiced by everyone, regardless of nationality, not just pirates. It was a very effective way of hampering the enemy's economy, whilst boosting your own. These raids could be anything from small descents against individual plantations to full-scale attacks on towns and fortified cities. On some occasions, Indian and African settlements were directly attacked in search for slaves. Not even free people of African, native or mixed race origin were safe. Any non-white captured by a hostile nationality or pirate crew could expect to be sold into slavery. The Spanish were less discriminate in this regard, often enslaving white pirates as well. Buccaneers also acquired slaves by attacking the slave ships themselves. Buccaneers could roam along the African coast, but it was easier to lie waiting in the Lourdes Antilles, the eastern gateway to the Caribbean. The human cargo was ferried off to the slave markets. Buccaneers had no problem selling off their slaves and could do it to plantation owners, government officials or merchants. Jamaica was the most popular destination. The island maintained an extensive smuggling network with the Spanish colonies, known as the sloop trade. Due to Spanish restrictions on trade, smuggling was sometimes the only option for the colonies to obtain certain products, including slaves. The legal slave trade was managed by national monopoly companies, such as the Royal African Company in England. In Spain, the slave trade was managed by foreign countries through a monopoly privilege called the Asiento. In 1677, a Scottish buccaneer captured a Dutch ship carrying African slaves for a Spanish colony. Captain Brown carried his cargo to English Jamaica, where he was arrested for piracy. Brown argued that his capture was legal, since he had a commission from the French, who were at war with the Dutch. Never mind that the commission had expired the previous year. The crew were acquitted, 
but the governor had Brown hanged behind his counsel's back. He didn't want to ruin relations with Spain, who were now at peace with England. But by now, the stolen slaves had already been sold and were being smuggled to the Spanish colonies, most likely at a cheaper price than what the Dutch offered. This incident highlights the complicated relations of trade, piracy and slavery present in the late 17th century, and it's really why the period is so interesting. In the movies, slaves can let out a sigh of relief when a pirate ship is sighted. The slaves were in much more danger than the actual crew. Despite slavery being tolerated, the practice was recognized as barbaric, and slavery crews were considered the scum of the earth. Pirates made no scruples about recruiting them into their crews. Bartholomew Roberts, often regarded as the most successful pirate, began his sailing career aboard a slave ship. The slaves themselves could expect no such treatment. Captain Pascal of the slave ship Sarah was tied to a mast along with two of his slaves, both of which were shot. The pirates spared the captain because, quote, he was such a bold fellow, unquote. In short, arbitrary mistreatment was always imminent. Enslaved women could expect sexual violence, but it doesn't seem like there was a prevalence of sex slaves aboard pirate ships themselves. Woods Rogers recounted an incident where several free black women were accepted aboard his ship to do the cooking, laundry, etc. When one of them was found pregnant, he had her whipped and had her companions warned that lewdness would not be tolerated. We see a frequent mention in pirate codes that women would not be tolerated aboard. It would invariably lead to disputes amongst the crew. The pirates made frequent enough landfalls to say their urges. In Africa, they rendezvoused with native prostitutes, either in European or native African settlements. Settled pirates in Africa would often have multiple black wives. However, Rogers wrote of another incident where he gifted a sex slave to a Portuguese priest. We put our young padre ashore and gave him, as he desired, the prettiest young female negro we had in the prize. The young padre parted with us extremely pleased and leering under his hood upon his black female angel. We doubt he would crack a commandment with her and wipe off the sin with the church's indulgence. This was undoubtedly practiced by pirates as well. It was common for European gentlemen to own and raise little black boys as their private companions, as a sort of pet or assistant. Pirates practiced it as well. Sometimes, black or mixed race children were explicitly kidnapped by pirates to be used as servants. William Dumper recounted in his journal of a very pretty boy, about seven or eight years of age, which Captain Swan kept. The woman cried and begged hard to have him. But Captain Swan would not, but promised to make much of him, and was as good as his word. He proved afterwards a very fine boy of her wit, courage and dexterity, and I have often wondered at his expressions and actions. It is not known if pirates sexually abused these young boys. Pedophilia was common enough in the Royal Navy to be a punishable offence, but it is a complicated topic which I'm not going to discuss in this video, which is already complicated enough. Slaves were not only so valuable because they could be sold at a profit, but because they could be used as a slave labour aboard a pirate ship itself. Pirate ships were in many ways its own little world, an independent, self-sufficient society floating in the sea. Items which could fulfill a variety of purposes were thus highly esteemed. Silk could be sold to make money, but could also be used to make clothes or repair the sails, as was done by Captains Quelch and William Kidd. Slaves should be viewed from a similar angle. They could be captured in a multitude of ways kept for a variety of purposes, before being sold off when necessary. The most common use of slaves was heavy menial labour. Pirates were lazy and part of their lifestyle was the ability to do whatever they wanted. So having some slaves to clean your ship and clothes, man the pumps and carry your baggage was a welcome change from having to do it all yourself. Slaves were also kept for more specialized purposes like cooking and shoemaking. Several articles of agreement from throughout the period note that crewmen can be paid in slaves rather than money. Slaves were also offered as compensation for lost limbs. Pirates often became slave owners after retiring. Blackbeard's retired quartermaster, William Howard, was seen in the company of two slave servants. Henry Morgan and Bartholomew Sharp both owned slaves and purchased property on Jamaica. Some pirates had even been slaveholders before becoming pirates. These include Blackbeard, Henry Jennings, Steed Bonnet and Francis Fernando. Fernando is a less known associate of Jennings and I included him because he was a mulatto himself. Other pirates retired as slave traders themselves. Adam Baldridge, a former buccaneer, established a trading outpost on Madagascar. He supplied the local pirates with necessities from New York, 
and traded extensively with the native tribes. He accompanied them in their conflicts and would sell prisoners of war as slaves. When one of the tribes discovered that he had sold their own kinsmen into slavery, they rose up and destroyed the outpost. John Ledstein, alias Old Crackers, was a former pirate who opened up a similar outpost on the Sierra Leone in West Africa. He supplied pirates like Bartholomew Roberts with native prostitutes and also sold slaves to the Americas. Pirates had been the rock star heroes of the 1600s, but by the turn of the century, attitudes began to shift. Colonies had consolidated and were no longer dependent on buccaneers as a means of military defense and economic expansion. There was an interest in preserving peaceful commerce, and pirates, by attacking friendly nations, became a problem. So there was a crackdown. Once the buccaneers had been able to commit what we'd call war crimes today, and get away with it with a slap on the wrist, the sailors after this point would be hanged without question if they committed the slightest act of seaborne crime. The people who consorted with pirates were treated with severe scrutiny, and suddenly it became very hard for a pirate to sell his plunder, slaves included. First you had to find a location where your plunder was in demand. Next, you'd have to find a customer willing to take the risk. You also had to contend with the local authorities, hoping they'd turn a blind eye. Capturing slave ships suddenly became a nuisance. But in the late 1710s, the slave trade took a massive hit at the hands of pirates. In 1719, as many as 100 slave ships were captured by pirates, and only one in 24 arrived safely in the Americas. Reports from Martinique and Barbados claim a shortage of slaves and high prices. In short, we have documented evidence of extensive pirate attacks on slave shipping and the plantation industry suffering as a result. So if pirates wanted to sell their slaves to the plantations, wouldn't we have heard about it? What exactly happened to the slaves? This is partly where the idea of pirates liberating slaves stemmed from. It is hard to document illicit trade, and like I mentioned in the previous video, most historians focus on English and, to a lesser extent, French records. Most of the illicit trade in the 17th century had been done with the Spanish, and it most likely continued into the 18th. One contemporary newspaper stated that the pirates who roamed the African coast sold their slaves in Portuguese Brazil. The Spanish and Portuguese were so hungry for slaves that they couldn't care if they had been stolen from their national rivals. Even better. But there were other reasons to attack slave ships. They carried valuable produce like cola nuts, beeswax, camwood, gold, malagueta peppers, and high-quality ivory. The ships themselves were highly prized. Known as giddymen, they could be anything as small as a sloop to a fully rigged frigate. Since they had to transport a human cargo across an ocean before it expired, they had to be fast. They made for perfect pirate ships. Famous pirate ships like the Queen Anne's Revenge and Widdy Galley had all been slavers. Less famous examples include the Wyndham Galley, the Bachelor's Delight, and the Gambia Castle. Probably my favorite ship's name. So what happened to the slaves aboard these ships? If the pirates couldn't sell them, they either let the slavers keep them, abandoned them on a desolate beach, or worst case, threw them into the sea, where a certain hungry beast swam around waiting for them. A few famous pirates have falsely been recognized as liberators of slaves. Blackbeard, Bartholomew Roberts, and Samuel Bellamy. When Blackbeard captured the Queen Anne's Revenge, he let the French slavers keep 355 of their slaves and took 60 for himself. When the QR sank, his crew consisted of 40 whites and 60 blacks. I hear this repeated again and again as evidence of Blackbeard running a multicultural and egalitarian crew. We can also be certain that these men were sold off as slaves. Blackbeard spent the next months of his life operating in North Carolina a region which was especially starved for slaves. We know that Blackbeard maintained close relations with the local plantationers and officials, including the governor himself. One of his closest allies, the landowner Tobias Knight, purchased at least two slaves from the pirate. Slaves were also given to Blackbeard's retired crewmen, like the quartermaster, William Howard. When Blackbeard was defeated at Ocracoke, his crew consisted of six white men and four blacks. According to trial documents, these blacks were all slaves, and even agreed to testify against the pirates. It doesn't seem like they were entirely sold on the cause. Black Caesar wasn't part of Blackbeard's crew. He belonged to Tobias Knight. Samuel Bellamy, the Robin Hood of pirates. Surely, when he captured the slave ship Widder, he liberated the slaves aboard. By the time Bellamy captured the Widder, 
there was not a single slave left in her hold. They had already been sold off in Jamaica, and she was bound for the 13 colonies to sell her cargo. Bellamy never captured a cargo of slaves once in his career. Next we have Bartholomew Roberts. He made his profits from capturing slave ships and ransoming them back to their owner. One of these owners, Captain Fletcher of the Porcupine, refused to negotiate. So Roberts ordered the ship burned, along with the 80 slaves found aboard. Does that sound like an abolitionist to you? But we know that Roberts and Bellamy had black men aboard their ships. Indeed, many companies did. People usually take for granted that these men were given the same liberties as white pirates, which in most cases, we just don't know. Other examples tell us that pirate ships could harbor both free and enslaved Africans aboard, simultaneously. Indeed, pirates did recruit black Africans into their crews. But it wasn't always a given. There were several deciding factors. For one, what was his origin? There were free black sailors found in colonial ports and aboard European ships. In my previous video I spoke of the Jamaican privateer, Michael Kendall. In the Indian Ocean, Henry Avery was greeted in perfect English by a black sailor, the man having allegedly lived in London. There were even free blacks found working aboard slave ships. Language was arguably the most important factor in deciding a black man's fate aboard a pirate ship. What did pirates expect from someone inducted into their crew? They expected them to fight alongside them, to partake in democratic decision making, and to handle the complicated machinery that is their ship. All of this requires some experience and extensive communication. Pirates preferred to recruit experienced sailors for a reason, so they didn't have to teach them the ropes. You don't expect as much from a slave. All you need is a few grunts and a pointed pistol to make them man the pump or carry something heavy. So an African fresh off the boat speaking an African language was much less likely to be inducted into the pirate crew, compared to a black man born and raised under European language and customs in the colonies, regardless if he had been born a free man or a slave. Linguists were sometimes used internally to settle language barriers. A document from the early 18th century, a sort of privateer's manual, describes how French slaves can be recruited against their masters. It tells the captain to send a French-speaking crewman to the slaves, who will ask them to speak with a ringleader, who will promise them their freedom and a bit of money in return for their services. There are even a few instances of pirates speaking African languages. Like I mentioned in the first chapter, names and baptism played a big role in the black man's status. Slaves were often given names from antiquity, such as Caesar, Ajax, and Pompey, to distinguish them from whites and to separate them from their native culture. Some slave owners were disgusted by blacks giving Christian names. Blackbeard's accomplice, Tobias Knight, protested against the four black pirates testifying against him, saying that they were only Negroes, even if they had been given Christian names. When Woods Rogers inducted a group of Spanish slaves into his crew, he gave them English names and told them to see themselves as Englishmen. Even if a black man did speak English, his safety wasn't guaranteed. Free blacks and mulattoes could easily be captured by pirates and sold into slavery. It was dependent on the pirates' own attitudes and their own necessities. If they were desperate for manpower, they might look past their own biases, provided they had any in the first place. Thomas Gerard was a free mulatto sailor from the island of Antigua. His ship was captured by the pirate Steed Bonnet, and after some time in captivity, he was approached by one of the pirates. According to Gerard's testimony, the encounter went as follows. One of the men came and asked if I would join with them. I told him, no. He said, I was but like a negro, and they made slaves of all that color, if I never shared any of the goods. Other eyewitnesses corroborated that Gerard was threatened with slavery, and though he did join the pirates, he never took any of their plunder. For this reason, he was acquitted of any crimes. Still, the judge lambasted him, saying it was preferable to be a slave than a pirate. Maybe he should try it out himself. Let us return again to my example of the buccaneer ship Trinity. The crew included free blacks and Indians that fought, voted, and took shares of the plunder. But there were also enslaved blacks aboard, who didn't speak English, and were forced to do the drudgery. Some of the white crewmen were racist, others antipathic. The buccaneers put down a slave revolt aboard a ship, and at the end of the journey, they gave a malada boy to the captain, and offered the black shoemaker his freedom. Pirates weren't abolitionists, but they weren't necessarily racist either. They were selfish, lazy, and opportunistic. They were a driving force in establishing the early sugar empires of France and England. We remember them for sword fights and stolen ships, not the immense suffering that they caused to the most vulnerable people in the age of sail. 
Slavery tends to be viewed from extreme viewpoints. Either it is swept under the rug, or viewed as a unique product of white supremacy. It is a very emotionally loaded topic, and I think that prevents us from having productive discussions. We need to discuss why slavery actually happened, and who benefited from it. By doing that, we can understand that it isn't a unique phenomenon, but one of many methods in which labor and population has been controlled throughout history. Still is to this day. We can endure chocolate at cheap prices because it is harvested through slave labor. The upper classes of western countries see no problem with importing thousands of sheep laborers to perform seasonal agricultural work, cleaning and other menial assignments. In 2020, Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko, the base traditionalist, directed thousands of migrants and refugees to neighboring Poland and the Baltic countries in order to destabilize them. Politicians and profiteers continue to exploit human labor and population for their own ends, indiscriminate of human suffering and the long-term effects on society. But hey, in the 18th century they got cheap sugar, and we get cheap avocados, right? Huge thanks to my Patreon supporters, in particular, Cole Freer, Max Dweck, Michaela Jantz, 1660, Daniel Stryker, and Sea Dog. If you enjoyed the video, sharing it with a friend or on social media will help me immensely. And if you'd like to interact with me or fellow pirate enthusiasts, check out the link to our Discord server in the video description. Hope to see you there! Cheers.